So today we are happy to have uh, Andre Chukuko from University of Minnesota and will be telling us about interplay between superconductivity and a non thermal liquid in a metal. Oh, thank you. Thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my first time in this building. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I will tell the story. Uh, that is the result of the work of a number of people, and you will see the full list of people at the end. This particular story will be about the work, series of works done with Artem Abedov from Texas A&M, with whom I worked for a number of years. Yushan Vang, who is now professor at Florida, and uh, Yumin Wu is a postdoc in Stanford, and Shang Shu Zhang is a postdoc in Minnesota. And I have a request. Uh, I don't want to lose you in 10 minutes. So please interrupt me, ask questions, and it will be easier to stop at some point rather than rush to the very end. Uh -huh. And at this moment, we realize that it worked. It worked a minute ago. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Ah, strangely. So uh, there are many systems. If you ask experimentalists where superconductivity occurs, of course, in many uh, different materials. But I'll be mostly interested in the situation when superconductivity emerges and gets enhanced, when the system of fermions is about to do something else, about to develop order not in particle-particle, but rather in a particle-whole channel. The most notable example is a series of heavy fermion materials in which clearly the system is about to order antiferromagnetically if I change pressure. And before it orders or close to the point where ordering temperature goes to zero, there is a dome of superconductivity emerging here. There is a dome of superconductivity emerging close to ferromagnetic transition, and the details of the story, there is a probably another ferromagnetic transition that goes right through the middle of this point, so against the dome. And most studied materials are, of course, cuprates in which uh, there is anti-ferromagnetic order without doping, you dope by either hole and electrons, and superconductivity emerges either way. And a uh, slightly baby version of cuprates is another set of superconducting materials, which are supposed to be high temperature superconductors. This iron-based materials in which, again, there is a magnetism. Before you dope, you dope by hole and electrons, or do even the isovalent doping, and the system becomes superconducting. And there is also a possibility that not necessarily magnetism is involved. There is a well-studied and very actively studied materials. Now they are in selenium, either under doping or under pressure, uh, where the system has, without extra parameters, the system has another type of order. It's called pneumatic order, when the system spontaneously breaks symmetry between x and y directions. And again, there is a transition line of this order that tends to end and before and end, there is superconductivity emerges. And here is what I'm going to talk about. My goal is to understand sort of fundamental thing. Whether this superconductivity that emerges when the system is about to develop some other order as a boundary, whether it's conventional in the sense that you include all possible additions to BCS theory of superconductivity, which often goes with the name of Eliasberg theory, and solves these equations and finds superconductivity. Or it's something qualitatively new. And of course, I'm standing here because I want to argue that there is qualitatively new, fundamentally non-BCS superconductivity, which comes out this so let me, without much preparation on the issue, let me just set a stage. The stage is that I take a system of fermions. You will see there will be interaction involved. Uh, and as a function of some external parameter, it can be, for condensed matter physics, it can be doping, pressure, magnetic field, anything. Then the system is moving under the influence of external parameter and reaches a point where it develops some sort of order. And I will not even that much specify which order it develops. Most likely magnetic, ferromagnetic, <laughs> antiferromagnetic, but it also can be pneumatic order or circulating current order or some other order. And I want to know what happens close to this point. And there are three basic facts 
known about system behavior close to what's called quantum critical point. Quantum because it's a phase transition at zero temperature. It's obviously, uh, obviously determined by quantum fluctuations and dynamics involved. So one is that if I ask you, yes, there is interaction. Generally, it's a separate story that requires a whole discussion, a whole seminar, but let me say it about this in one phrase. Generally, interaction between electrons is repulsive interaction. And so the very issue how to get superconductivity out of repulsive interaction, but these people were writing papers about for the last 40 years. It turns out that non-S wave superconductivity, non-ordinary S wave superconductivity can appear out of repulsive interaction by a mechanism that you screen effective interaction and you generate long range component of interaction and this long range component is oscillating and oscillations means that occasionally repulsive interaction can be over screened over screening of repulsive interaction means that it becomes attractive at some regions of coordinate space and if you find the proper channel of proper angular momentum channel then at this over screening wins and better with under screen. Long story short, statement is that at least in all examples that I gave you, you can find a channel, angular momentum channel, and which interaction will be attractive. Attractive interaction, and then of course, what is interaction? We come close to a point where the system is about to develop order. Obviously, there should be a low soft boson associated with fluctuations of the order parameter near this point. This is a fluctuation of order parameters that condenses on the other side of transition. And this interaction obviously enhances close to critical point simply because mass of the boson becomes smaller. And as a result, if nothing else interferes, if I only say, well, let's take essentially three fermions, interaction mediated by soft boson and see what we get. Then the answer is superconductivity because we find channels when this effective interaction is attractive. And moreover, the superconductivity has to be enhanced right at the point of the transition, simply because mass of the boson is zero here, which means that effective interaction is the largest. So this point number one, fact number one. But there is another fact which goes against the first one, that if I forget about superconductivity and ask a different question, the same interaction mediated by soft boson but viewed now in a particle hole rather than particle-particle channel, always they give rise to fermionic self-energy. And if you are again considering interaction mediated by soft boson and calculate self-energy, you find that right at this point, examples I will show you later, self-energy scales as omega to some power alpha smaller than one. And the fact that scales as power of alpha smaller than one means two things. First, the real and imaginary part of the functions are the same by simple Kramer's chronic. Second, it overshoots bare omega in fermionic propagator, which is code word for what is called as non-fermi liquid. Meaning that non-fermi liquid means that self-energy can never be small at small frequencies, doesn't become small at small frequencies, compared to bare omega, and both real and imaginary part of this self-energy are the same order. This means that if you forget about pairing and just look at what happens with fermions in the normal state, you have a region where the system demonstrates what's called non-fermi liquid behavior, which specific meaning is this. Self-energy has this particular form. And the third basic fact is obvious. There's a competition between two tendencies. One tendency is towards non-fermi liquid, another tendency is towards pairing and this uh, tug of war game is that's what I'm going to talk about. And competition is on a trivial level in some sense. You will see it later in the formulas, but level is trivial. On one hand, if there is a strong fermionic self-energy, fermions become incoherent. Incoherent fermions, of course, are less subjective to pairing than coherent fermions, simply because when you solve for the pairing, you need fermionic self-energy appears always in denominator. So, in some words, if you have non-fermi liquid fermions with this anomalous self-energy, you don't have what is normally called Cooper logarithm, namely that in a particle-particle channel you have a logarithm, and this logarithm gives rise to pairing no matter how weak it's attractive interaction. On the other hand, if you pair fermions, if you manage to pair them, 
you immediately produce a gap in the fermionic spectrum. The gap immediately eliminates scattering at low frequencies, simply because there is no phase space for scattering anymore. As a result, self-energy gets smaller, and you go back to Fermi liquid. So if this guy wins, this means forget about non-Fermi liquid. If this guy wins, then there will be no superconductivity. And here is interesting story. It's not like there are two different interactions that give rise to one phenomenon or the other. It's the same interaction mediated by soft boson near a critical point, which if you look to the left, it gives rise to attraction, strong attraction in the in the particle particle channel. You look to the right, the same interaction viewed in a particle hole channel destroys Fermi liquid. And the result there is no separation of parameters unless somebody wants to introduce large n and uh, do it in a little bit more sophisticated way. So coupling constants for both channels is the same. So which means that you cannot separate between them parametrically. Again, if you don't introduce large n, which at one point I will do. One slide, and then I will show you what I'm going to do. So, even this problem can be considered in different um, approximations. So, the one that I will use, in fact, follows from textbook examples of electron phonon interaction, but now viewed through eyes of electron electron interaction. Namely, that somehow bosonic excitations are slow mode compared to fermions. For those who may remember electron phonon interaction, it was a standard story, goes under the name of Migdal theorem, related to the fact that velocity of phonons, uh, basically the by velocity, is much smaller than Fermi velocity, or the by frequency much smaller than Fermi energy. Here we don't have the by frequency. Everything is one scale. Fermi energy, we deal with the electrons all the time. Interact, electrons interact with each other. But it turns out that for most examples, when you approach critical point at zero temperature, your bosons are completely overdumped due to scattering uh, into um, particle hole pairs. And as a result, bosonic excitations are overdumped and fermions initially are propagating. And this by itself tells you that effective velocity of fermions is larger, parametrically larger than effective velocity of bosons. And what it does, what this condition does, in fact, is very simple. It just tells you how to do calculations. And in mathematical sense, it just tells you effective self-consistent one-loop theory, self-consistent theory, you deal with full functions all the time, is enough and all corrections will be small due to small parameter which you go here. It goes under the name of Eliasberg theory because it's similar in some sense to what Eliasberg did for electron phonon interaction. But again, this result does not necessarily be the same as with conventional Eliasberg theory. And in practice, it means this. We have two objects in terms of what to write. We have fermionic self-energy, which accounts for non-Fermi liquid. And we have pairing vertex, which accounts for superconductivity. This is just C dagger, C dagger two fermions going out, or CC, two fermions going in. And essentially, you write down one loop self-energy involving full green functions, and one loop randomization of phi also involving full bosonic propagator and full green functions. And the rule which is set here, it just tells you that at the end of the day, you can do all integration over momenta in this diagram explicitly. You know how to factorize momentum integration, blah, blah, blah. You know, you need to take this pairing vertex and channel it into proper spatial or angular momentum channel, which gives attraction. And if we spare all details here, which are important, but will be, were discussed by quite a large number of people, you end up with something that looks on a first glass very simple, that you do momentum integration in all these diagrams, and at the end of the day, this momentum dependence becomes irrelevant here. So at least you know it. And everything becomes just like zero plus one <coughs> dimensional problem. That what you are left with is frequency integration. And you are interested in self-energy and pairing vertex both as a function of frequency. But remember, this guy going as omega to some power smaller than one is non-Fermi liquid. So non-Fermi liquid is present here. This is interesting, what will come out here. And 
These are, in fact, the only equations that I will show before to, about the results. So we have two set of two coupled equations. On the first glance, it looks like almost simple. Just put everything in the computer, you get the result right away. But it turns out that no, it's not that simple. So we have equation for the pairing vertex and equation for the self-energy. Both depend on the Zermatsubara frequencies. And competition here is really on a most straightforward level. Pairing vertex, so self-energy is a denominator of equation for phi. Pairing vertex is a denominator and equation, the right-hand side of equation for sigma. So the larger is phi, generally the smaller and sigma. The larger is sigma, the smaller and phi. And what we normally call a superconducting gap, this stamp quantity that shows up in every experiment, is just a ratio, in fact, of this pairing vertex and omega plus sigma. If there is no sigma, then pairing vertex and superconducting gap is the same. Chi L? Yes, this is what I was going to say. There is one quantity here, which I didn't define yet. Chi. This is effective interaction integrated along the Fermi surface. This is how momentum integration is done. And all we need to know what this quantity is. And it turns out that if boson is massive, namely you are not at the critical point, you are some distance away from the critical point, <coughs> then no matter what you do, you get a very simple result. That this guy is zero frequency. This is two fermionic frequencies, so different between them is bosonic frequency. So if you take this guy at zero bosonic frequency, it's a constant. If it's a constant, then you immediately find out that self-energy is linear in omega and five small frequencies goes to a constant. You go to what is called BCS or Eli Ashberg theory of superconductivity. The difference is in BCS, the gap is approximated as a constant up to cutoff and then goes to zero. In Eli Ashberg theory, it starts with a constant and then has some frequency dependence. So it's sort of soft cutoff instead of sharp one, and then dies off as a function of frequency instead of being constant and then jump to zero. So the difference really is soft cutoff versus hard cutoff. But in both cases, the fact that this guy is constant at small frequencies means that sigma is linear in omega. This means Fermi liquid. Means that if real part is omega, imaginary part is omega square or whatever, and then you get completely coherent excitations at small frequencies. Um, so, yeah. So, so by small frequencies in particular, you mean smaller compared to the mass of the boson? Smaller compared to the mass of the boson. Yes, exactly. Smaller compared to the mass of the boson. Yes. But let's now go to quantum critical point. We want to look what happens right at this point. And here we find one qualitatively different aspect. Namely, that if you take this guy, mass is zero, so as you said, the scale below the mass collapses, and the question is, what's outside the scale? And what is outside the scale is this interaction. Again, this is integrated massless boson, integrated over momenta along the Fermi surface. It diverges at zero frequency as omega to some power of gamma. This exponent depends on what kind of problem you consider. It will be next slide when I show examples. But it diverges. And because it diverges, you put it here, divergent quantity. You get self-energy that goes immediately as omega to power of one minus gamma. This is non fermi Can I ask you sure, sure. two questions? So these are the Euclidean Matsubara, omega Matsubara frequencies. This is what, sir? Matsubara. Yes, so that's all Matsubara. Matsubara. And phi and sigma are real number? Will it they turn out? Phi sigma and Matsubara is a, defined as a real number. Sigma this is how I defined green function. I omega plus mm -hmm. sigma bracket closes, minus epsilon k. So I define sigma as a real number. Mm -hmm. And phi, and phi to... is defined, of course, up to overall phase. You want phase, which I said to be real. Mm -hmm. yeah. This why is this phi. Yes. On Matsubara frequency, I defined any superconducting quantities, define it up to it, it, you want phase. So I just fed, set phase equal to zero, and this quantity is real. And again, this quantity is defined as also real. On the real axis, you will see this where they will be different. Andre, yeah. Sorry. Uh, the, the, the formula in the upper box is a standard formula, right? So they Except for this. No, no, no. The, in the upper box. In the upper box, this one? Right. Yes, but again, if, if I put here, it depends what quantity I put here. 
if I put here quantity of one over omega to power yeah, of gamma, is, yeah, but you understand something. To, uh, this looks like a standard formula for, 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 for Fermi liquid with a weak interaction. Um, but then you're saying that chi is very different, and you will explain whether these exponents come from. Uh -huh. Yeah. But even bef because chi is very different, which means different processes, strong interaction, or something happened, uh -huh. those formulas remain the same. Formulas remain the same. How, yeah. How, why? Mm? How and why? Uh, because there are two parameters. You took this form of the upper box from one book, the lower book, the lower one from another book, or another chapter, and combine them. Well, with. you may put it this way. I thought I wrote the book by myself. Uh, yeah. but, <laughs> but basically, there is a question. How? How comes that I basically eliminated this condition, which I returned back? This is a standard, it's true, it's absolutely standard Fermi liquid story, and it's a Leartberg theory for a Fermi liquid. I said, okay, I will show you next slide that at the critical point, this guy will become singular. The question is why the equation stays the same. And the answer is that you have two parameters in the problem. One hand, there is actually parameter mass, and by interaction mass, divided by the mass. By mass, you mean gap. Mass of a boson. Which means gap. Gap of a gap of a bosonic spectrum, yes. And this parameter becomes infinite when mass goes to zero. Very good. But there is another parameter that tells you that even in this situation, over bo renormalized boson, sorry, renormalized formulas with some non fermi liquid dispersion will have velocity, effective velocity, which is larger than velocity of overdumped boson. If that second condition is satisfied, that all vertex corrections that will change these equations are small to the extent of another parameter. Is there any condition for possible retardation, strong strength of retardation? This is retardation. This is strongest retardation you can imagine. It's one over omega to some power of gamma. So it's completely retarded. It's more question about corrections to formulas. And these corrections are in different parameters that tells you how, how soft, sorry, how slow are bosons compared to fermions. So the reason why the corrections are small is that you force fermions to vibrate on boson frequencies, on effective boson frequencies. And if these frequencies are much smaller than internal fermionic frequencies, you force them to vibrate far away from their resonance. As a result, perturbation theory, corrections are small. So but short answer, different parameters. Okay, let me show you this. Uh, this all goes under the name of gamma model and number of people is very large. Let me show you two examples. Both are in two dimensions. You take story about massive boson, M is a massive boson, which is picked at zero momentum. This is why expansion starts with Q square. And you have Landau dumping, which is omega over Q. As I said, what you need to get effective chi, you need to take this guy and integrate along the Fermi surface. Why? Because integration transfers to the Fermi surface is only taken care by fermions. So you take one dimensional integration over Q of this guy and obtain a function that if M is finite, of course, it's regular expansion in omega. If M is zero, you get one over omega one third. So this is fact exponent is one third. You want to do the same for a case of antiferromagnetic fluctuations or any fluctuations with finite Q. Then the only difference is that this Q that you get in the denominator is a constant and you expand around some other momentum. Again, you do the same integration, you get power one half. You can get power one, you can get power 0.7, you can get power 1.2. So there is a number of works, including the last thing. This is SYK story. SYK is interacting, SYK formulas, dispersionless formulas, is interacting between themselves or interacting with Einstein phonons. And then nice thing is that you get the same model, but exponent gamma depends on the ratio. If you take example, when there's a large number of fermionic flavor and large number of bosons, the, the exponent gamma depends on their ratio. Okay. Sorry, yeah. one more question. Um, sure, sure. Uh, high is, uh, mm, is um, mm, 
longitudinal response not transversal. Right? At this stage, it doesn't matter because I am in the disordered state. Sorry, I'm state without order. So then longitudinal transverse is the same. So I don't distinguish between, I have a boson, it can be multi-component boson, like spin fluctuation. But then all components of spin fluctuations are the same before I introduce a order. So in this respect, it's the same. In the chart channel, there is no, 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 not even an issue of this, but... Uh, the union transversal with respect to momentum Q, how it's directed. It's directed... Uh, so the, the, this is response, it's a current, right? Um, no, no, there's no current, current. It's not current. So current can be run this way and momentum... It's, it's not current, it's just a power interaction. It's just a constant interaction. It's just C dagger C times phi with the coefficient G. So it's interaction with the density. Density, density. density. So it's yeah. yeah. Well, in this respect, yes, but it's density. So it's a fermionic density or say D wave component of fermionic density interacting or spin component can interact. But in spin, of course, there is a vector index, but not with respect to Q, with respect to direction and spin space. And why don't those damping play any role for density density response? Usually it's play a role for transversal response, current to current, not for... Hmm? Because it's like this. You see, I'll try to rephrase the question so it may be. Current is a conserved, sorry, density is a conserved quantity. So generally, if you take a proper limit, the Landau dumping shouldn't play any role because the conserved quantity shouldn't change if you take zero momentum and finite Q. Here we have to consider opposite limit because we'll take mass to zero. You basically get Q squared plus omega over Q. Omega over Q is part of this omega divided by square root of Q squared plus omega squared. But it turns out that here you need to have omega much smaller than Q. Omega scales as Q cube. So it's opposite limit to the one when you use word identity to the one when you, change, when you check conservation of order parameters. Conservation is opposite limit when Q is much smaller than omega. Here is Q is much larger than omega. So okay. Uh, 0 0.6? Sorry? 0 0.6 is a numerical value for gamma? Uh, Whereas was 0 0.6? Yeah, gamma is 0 0.6. Oh, yes, absolutely numerical value. Here is absolutely numerical. There is. No. Well, 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 well. Some crazy combination of gamma function if you want to answer it this way. Yes, it, 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 it is a combination of gamma function, but it's. it's uh, Nothing like that, just number. And again, I can take this gamma and make it any number between zero and two by just changing the ratio n over m on number of bosons and number of fermions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is very approximate, and, uh, yeah. Okay, now interesting stuff. Suppose I have this problem. And what I want to do, of course, every model that I put in has... Uh, Andrei, sorry, if gamma is approximate, then power law is also approximate, right? Power law, in the sense that... What's a kind of extrapolation of some more complicated law? In principle, I put it this way. It's a good question. For this case, this is not extrapolation. I just calculate. For this case, yes, it's extrapolation. Absolutely extrapolation. There is no such thing as 1.2 for any realistic system. No, complete extrapolation. Uh, this is also not extrapolation because you know that at the smallest frequency, it is power law. So there are cases when it's exact, there are cases when it's extrapolation. Okay, now, let me now take this guy as a continuous variable, just for us to look at the phase diagram. And then we put particular values of gamma that we want on this phase diagram. So here is I want to do it. I want to start in the normal state when I know that it's not Fermi liquid, self-energy goes as like this. And ask a question now, can we get pairing out of now non-Fermi liquid state? And the first thing, let me just try to forget about any analytical reasoning and do something simple. I have two equations, they really, all well, is absolutely right, they look simple and it's one loop equations. So why don't we put in the computer and computer will tell you what is the, is there any finite temperature below which phi becomes non-zero? So is there any finite temperature 
before, below which the system becomes superconducting? And the answer is yes. For any value of gamma, which is not shown here, but it's gamma, you get a transition temperature, which is just a function of gamma. Don't look that it goes up here. It just becomes unconstrained BCS, so it's triviality. So it's really like this is important. So there is a finite temperature. And you may say, OK, this is the end of the story. Yes. So I phrase it as a competition between non-Fermi liquid and pairing. Pairing wins. There is a finite temperature below which the system becomes superconducting. The end of the story. I'll put it even like this. It's the same, but I just want to phrase it differently. There is a transition temperature for any value of gamma below which this phi becomes non-zero. And I want to ask a simple question. Is it superconductivity and is it conventional theory? And for this, what is this? I hope this will be final result. So let's try to put it back. This is what I start with. This is what computer tells me, that there is a blue line. What I will try to argue is that there is much more than blue line. And in fact, there are two different superconducting phases and the phase when there are strong fluctuations in between. <coughs> the most important part of what I'm going to talk about is that there are two superconducting phases. And neither of them, although this one, this one can be adiabatically connected to Fermi, to Fermi liquid. In fact, this is also qualitatively different from Fermi liquid, and this is super qualitatively different from Fermi liquid. So the previous diagram is wrong? No, no. In the previous one, I just said there is a line. Mm -hmm. but I just said there is a line, but now I need to go below this line and see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I need to go through zero temperature line and see what's going on there. So it's not wrong. It's, this line is still the same. It's the same line. Yeah. But the question is, what is below this line? OK, so let me tell you something that I hope you will appreciate. Uh, let's look carefully why. Why we get this line. And for this, let's do one thing. Let's play a simple game. Let's go back to textbooks and ask how to find out superconductivity in a BCS theory. There are zillions of ways to find superconductivity in BCS theory. I will use the simplest one. Let's calculate superconducting susceptibility. So this will be BCS theory. Interaction is frequency independent. BCS in this case is gamma equal to zero. Interaction is a constant at small frequencies. So what I do? I put this constant interaction. I add some bare phi naught. And I need to solve this equation. That's a trivial procedure, in fact. To solve this equation, putting some phi naught in. We can solve it instantly, of course. Or we can just do it order by order and perturbation. This is what is called summation of Cooper logarithms. Namely, if I start putting this phi order by order into the integral part, I get equation in series of lambda times log 1 over t, lambda square log square 1 over t, something that everyone knows from the textbooks. And everyone knows that if you sum up this logarithm, you get denominator 1 minus lambda log. So it's a, this is what's called BCS superconductivity and superconductivity due to Cooper logarithms. You sum up these logarithms, susceptibility is what? You divide phi by phi naught, you get this, and then of course you find out, of course, there is a temperature, which is it should be, right, it should be e to minus one over, g e to minus one over lambda, standard exponentially small temperature below which the system becomes superconducting. Message here. Solve this equation iteratively, order by order. You get Cooper logarithms, you sum them up, you get divergence. Very good. Now let's try to do the same in our case, exactly the same calculations. This is what I get instead of what I had before. I had phi naught as before, but what are these parts? This is interaction. This is 1 over omega to power of gamma. This is I put self energy in, omega to power of 1 minus gamma. And this is leftovers that come from the fact that I do need to remember that at high frequencies, my omega will be still larger than omega 1 minus gamma. So I have some scale associated with this. I put this as extra piece. And if you look carefully here, you find that combination of power, this one and this one, still give you 1. So the problem is still marginal. Meaning that I, if I take this guy the simplest possible way, it just puts upper limit of summation here is g. 
then in the perturbation theory, I still get logarithm. Because if I put phi naught as a constant, then do this instead, so make integration instead of summation, I will get dx over x. So I will get logarithms. So let's see what we get. We sum up these logarithms. We can do it even at zero temperature. We assume that maybe there should be instability before zero temperature, but let's try to check. So we're at zero temperature. We try to sum up the series. And here is, uh, this is how our series looks like. There, yes, there is log, there is log square, etc., etc. But when you sum up the series, you find out that no, it's not, not nothing like one divided by one minus g log. It's a power. Power with this one minus gamma and the exponent. And this tells us that if you divide phi by phi naught, you get a positive function, which doesn't blow anywhere at finite frequency. Yes, it diverges at zero frequency, but it's not surprising. So there will be no scale at which the system will develop instability. So VCS corresponds to gamma equals gamma equal to zero. Yeah. Gamma equals zero. Yes, but you know, I already did this. I pulled out this omega to power of one minus gamma. So what I did, uh, it is, one has to be careful with this notation. This is only works when uh, there is inequality, which I put here. And it works. You cannot take a limit when gamma equal to zero here. Because what I did, I put this guy. And instead of this one, I put uh, upper cutoff. You can do it when there is, look, take gamma not equal to zero. Let's see what happens at large frequencies. You get omega 1 minus gamma, omega that give you power one, and extra omega to power of gamma, integral converges, right? If gamma goes to zero, this integral is no longer converges. I use convergence. This is why I obtain this expression. If you take a limit when gamma goes, when gamma goes to zero, you need to be a little bit more careful and you will see on one of the slides what you get there. So this is finite gamma because I already, I basically replaced this term as the upper cutoff in the ceiling. And then you get what you see here. So uh, there's a simple message here. I try to mimic what is done in BCS theory, and it turns out that I didn't get any instability. But I know from computers there is instability. So I'm doing something wrong here. Uh, and the way that it's wrong may be seen already here. Uh, or wrong or not quite right here is that as you notice that remember in BCS there is a coupling constant lambda here's the coupling constant the number one minus gamma so why is that because whatever coupling constant I get in the interaction appears in the self energy so I get one in numerator one in denominator and in fact the place the only place where this coupling g appears is the upper limit in the theory so it appears at the upper edge of the logarithm Okay, so let's do something better. Let's look at the same equation. I put the upper cut of SG here, just simple. Let's look at the same equation, but let's not solve it by summing up order by order in this logarithmical sense. Let's do this. Let's take equation as is, and we'll see immediately that at small frequencies, the kernel of this equation has dimension one, gamma one minus gamma. So, and we know what to do. If the kernel is actually minus one, then you search for the solution at the power law. Yes, we have power law at the end of the day, so I'm not saying anything new. You search for power law because if you put phi as any power law, the same power appears here, and the only thing you need is to match coefficients. So you search for the solution with some alpha. What we remember, yes, this is what summation of logarithms does, but it gives you real alpha. That's how I obtain by summing up logarithms. So let's substitute power alpha here and try to see at low frequencies matching between this part and this part. So phi zero is put to zero? Phi zero is not put to zero, but once look, if I put positive alpha here, this guy goes as one over omega to power of alpha, this one is omega to power of alpha. These are leading terms. So I try to match the leading terms. With phi, I have to match sub leading terms. So first thing I want to do is to match leading terms and then see whether I can get something else. Leading divergent terms, again, this term goes, if I substitute, 
This term goes as 1 over omega to power of alpha, and this one is also 1 over omega to power of alpha, and I match coefficients. And then we'll put in this guy. So, I already showed the answer is, it turns out that exponents are not real. Exponents are complex. So it's interesting because this equation by itself, it has absolutely no complexity in it. All coefficients are real. Nevertheless, you take this equation with real coefficients and obtain two complex exponents as a solution. And complex exponents is something different because if you take complex exponents and just put them together, it's the same expression. So your solutions start oscillating. And you know that, yeah, we neglected phi naught. Yes, we still, I still put phi naught as an overall factor, but this is what I found. Solution is oscillating. And this was obtained in condensed matter, and, and this was obtained by uh, quite a uh, number of people in high energy community, Klebanov and Ternopolsky, uh, two of them, in the context of different problems. Complex exponents. And what did you mean beta? Hmm? Beta is, what is beta? Oh, what is beta here? Sorry. You put everything here depends on parameter gamma. So beta is just number here. If I take, sorry, beta is a function of gamma, I'm sorry. So for any gamma, there is some value of beta. So far, there is just one parameter, gamma. And so beta is just a function of gamma. I have to put it here, of course. It's sum again. If you, everything, of course, here can be done analytically. Gamma beta is a combination of gamma functions. And so the result can be ready to update. Very good. Now, now I want to make a simple statement. That suppose when I did low frequencies, I get this. If I start doing calculations starting from high frequencies, I start with phi naught, and then I put corrections. An equation, let me go back and tell you, look at the equation again. This equation has all positive coefficients. So if I put start with phi equal to phi naught, next term, I put phi naught here, get correction, it's positive. Next term, I put second term, it's again positive. So if I do perturbation theory, then I only get positive corrections here. At the same time, I know that at my low frequencies, my solution must oscillate, and this means that it should go through zeros. And I cannot match. There is no way I start with one side and the direction only goes up. And on the other side, it oscillating. There's no way I can match. This means that perturbation theory doesn't work. In fact, if you would carefully find that there is a scale at which everything blows up and perturbation theory actually doesn't work. And the way to make it work is to do the same as we always do with superconductivity, saying that, well, this means introduce a condensate. And if you introduce a condensate, try to match with the condensate these two low frequency and high frequency solutions. And you can do it. And this will be superconducting instability, the one that computer showed us previously without going into details. But my point here is very simple. This is qualitative non-BCS. It has nothing to do with summation of Cooper logarithms. It has everything to do with the appearance of complex exponent and with oscillations. And yes, you can, you will see solutions in, in a moment. You can take this finite, not infinitesimally small value of this anomalous vertex phi and then solve nonlinear equation and find solution, which means that you will find solution for superconductivity. Very good. Uh, there's one thing to show what I just said a little bit nicer. I told you before that we deal with a problem which was interesting without any parameter. It was the same interaction that if you look to the left in a particle hole channel, it gives non-fermi liquid. Look to the right into particle particle channel, give you to pay, give rise to pay. Now let me relax this constraint just by hand, nothing more. It can be done by extending theory to matrix large n, but let's not do it. Let's just by hand do it. This. So I take interaction in the particle part, particle hole channel and leave it intact. I take interaction in the particle particle channel, which is the same interaction and multiply it by a factor of 1 over n. Just, just to see what's going on. And then in this equation, we get factor of 1 over n. And remember I told you that if coupling is small, 
then why don't we sum up logarithms? And then we expect power law behavior with real exponents. If n is 1, we know exponents are complex. So there should be a transition at some critical end between one behavior and the other. And this exactly, of course, would come from the calculations. This can be really done in five minutes, and everything is related to properties of gamma functions that you get there. So basically, go from complex exponent to real exponent. Two complex exponent merchants become real exponents. So what happens is that as a function of gamma, there is a critical line, n of gamma, which separates between real exponents, which means normal state, non-fermi liquid state, and complex exponent to the superconducting state. So you see zero temperature transition. It's also a funny thing. It's a clean system, no impurities, but there is a possibility to either have non-fermi liquid or have superconductivity, and there is a critical transition here, and you can study it with it, of course, properties of a system close to the critical point. There is some costerly style like behavior near this point, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a fun story to basically take some value of n, any number close, different from one, and study this transition. Um, yeah. It's a bit of a tangential question, but can you fit the uh, half of lowest Landau level into this and see if it lies in the normal one state? One third. It's a problem of gamma one third. I see, I see, yeah. I see. It was one of the first things that was done. Right, right, right. It's a gamma one third problem. So, so that, that would definitely be yeah. in the normal state. Yeah. 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 Okay, there is one boundary case between non Fermi liquid and uh, what I just, between, sorry, between BCS and what I just said. It's a case when gamma really is zero plus. And if gamma is really plus, you get logarithmical physics here. Power law becomes logarithmic. And then you can do the same calculations following what Dan did a number of years ago. And let me do it my way. Uh, let me do it perturbative expansion in lambda. Now, there is log coming from here, log coming from particle particle channel. So you get expansion in powers of log square. That's crazy expansion, right? 1 half, 524, 61, 720, etc. And uh, one need a sharp eye to see that this is nothing but the expansion of one over cosine function. And it's true. If you expand one over cosine, you will get exactly this. Uh, and then, of course, you find out, yes, it is pi that it's not a simple series, 1 plus x plus x squared plus etc. You do find phi over phi naught diverging when this guy first becomes equal to pi over 2. And this argument becomes pi over 2. And this gives you scale for Tc, which is still depends on the coupling, but as e to minus 1 over square root of lambda instead of 1 over lambda. But this is a limiting case. So in BCS, this would be e to minus 1 over lambda. In this limiting case, e to minus 1 over square root of lambda. For all other cases, there is no exponent. There is only power law behavior because of this complex exponent. So this is a case when you still have conventional behavior, but with a very funny coefficients. Let me now tell you something that accompanies this non-Fermi liquid, sorry, non-BCS pay. So before I said that, great, it's a new physics, great, it's complex exponent, but the question is, so what? Well, there is one interesting so what. Remember, we deal with oscillations at small frequencies and conventional perturbation theory at high frequencies. And we put now solve nonlinear equation, and we want to match. And the question is how to match. Well, there is one simple thing, how to match. Just put finite value of phi such that you kill completely all these oscillations. You can do this. And then you get a regular solution of nonlinear equation. Great. It's one possibility. But there is another possibility. Let it system go, make one oscillation, one time sign change, and then kill all others. Or allow it to do two oscillations and then kill the rest. And long story short, that basically means that there are a number of possibilities to solve nonlinear equation. These are words. And uh, right, so what I was trying to argue is that, in fact, in this situation, in standard BCS or Eliasberg theory, you just had one solution. 
Here the number of solution is infinite. And I'll try to argue that. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that you can get a solution in which you kill all oscillations, or you can get solutions in which you kill all except for one, all except for two, all except for three, etc., etc. Let me show the results. These are numerical results. Dash, uh, blue line is what you put in, dashed line is what you get out, and the art, of course, is to match in and out, which would mean that you have a solution. And you see that we have pretty good matching here. This is the solution in which, as I said, the gap function just goes to a constant at small frequencies, no oscillations. It changes sign once, it changes sign two times here. And they all are solutions of nonlinear equation. And this is again qualitatively different from PCS theory because it turns out that uh, essentially here you get uh, not one but many solutions. And we did one thing analytically. It turns out that you can, it's also a usual thing. Let's try to find opposite end. One end is just solution with no oscillations. Let's assume that you have can we get a solution with infinite number of oscillations? And that would be a solution of linearized equation. And it turns out that this solution exists, does exist, in fact. At, uh, when exported this complex, and we find the exact solution. So we solve this integral equation, find the exact solution. For those who want to know what it is, solution is infinite series of hypergeometrical functions. But you can write in equation for the solution and then solve it, solve it numerically and you get a perfect match between difference. So this means that yes, this might prove that you do have infinite number of solutions because we know solutions one by one and then we know exactly what this uh, endpoint is. And we also try to do this. If there is infinite number of solutions, which are labeled by index n, 0, 1, 2, etc., then there should be infinite number of critical temperatures for all the solutions. And this is another numerics. We find critical temperature for the eigenfunction that had no zeros, critical temperature for eigenfunction with one zero, two zero, three zero, four zeros, and uh, accuracy of numerics nowadays is that we have 17 solutions. One seven. And they behave pretty much exactly as expected. The one that appears as highest temperature has the highest value the ones that appear as a smaller temperature, smaller value, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a bunch of a uh, uh, column of solutions. And then you ask me a question, and then, and so what? Uh, and as long as solutions are discrete, the answer is it's great. We get great satisfaction of getting this, but it's useless in some sense. Useless in the sense that we can ask a question. Each solution has what's called condensation energy. How much you lower the energy of a system by making this solution? And this quantity is proportional to the total number of particles in the system, to the volume of the system. And then, as long as the set is discrete, you find out that the most trivial solution, in which you don't have any remaining oscillations of your function, is it has the lowest, the, low, the largest condensation energy, means the lowest ground state energy. All other solutions have larger discrete set of energies. And then you can say, well, why should I worry about all this part if I have this red dot? And it's true. It's absolutely true. If you have discrete set of solutions, you only care about the lowest energy. My next point will be this, that we can calculate condensation energy as a function of number of solution for various gamma. And this is formula which I want to show you. And it shows the interesting thing, that there is special behavior for one value of the exponent, which will be, well, why is that value become clear in a minute? But you see, forget about this factor for a second, take gamma equal to one. Then expansion is one plus n plus n squared, Etc. and in not proportional to the volume of the system. So you really have a discrete set of solutions, and the one with n equal to zero is the smallest one, or the largest negative. Very good. Uh, so then 
you look into this and find out that n gets multiplied by 2 minus gamma, and therefore something special happens when gamma approaches 2, because this guy seems to vanish, this guy seems to vanish, etc., etc. But of course, we cannot do it like this. We need to take double limit. First of all, we notice that for any finite n, all energies become like EC0. And in order to see dispersion here, you need to take a double limit. Take gamma to 2 and to infinity. And then I have a continuous set. As a some sense, it's the same as like Fonon spectrum appears from discrete solution of Schrodinger equation for a system of finite size. If you take system size to infinity, all solutions with finite n, they collapse into one, and you get a tail coming from the solution when number n goes to infinity inverse to the system size. So you get a continuous spectrum here. And this is something that, well, come out from the theory, and it's really qualitatively new stuff. And very quickly, let's go forward. Let's make gamma even larger than two. You go back. So it looks like this. All the solutions, they tend to come to this point. They basically become more and more dense, and then eventually they all collapse here as a particular value, and then it go back. And what I will try to argue in the remaining, we'll see how many minutes, is that this red guy, after all this guy whispered something into his, its ear, this red guy becomes qualitatively different. So they, all other solutions approach the, the thread one, merge with it, change it, and then move away. And this solution will become very different from what it was before. And this is my two superconducting states, state one and state two. Let me ask a question, how much time I have, because I don't remember exactly when we started. Five minutes after, yeah. Okay, I'll try to finish before ten, in five plus minutes. So, which obviously means that I will skip the second part, but let me, at least, I try to make a statement here. So, let me tell you very quickly why this gamma equal to 2 is special, and you will see that there is another interesting aspect of the problem here related to topology. So why special? Why we obtain this? If you look at Matsubara axis, the answer is I really don't know why, because if I just look at the solution for the gap, nothing happens. This is n equal to 0 solution, and it's pretty much the same for all values of gamma, and it can go through gamma equal to 2 without much notable changes. It always starts with a constant and then goes down and disappears. So let's take this. This is a conventional solution, right? Now what I will do in the remaining three, four minutes, I will take this solution and convert it to real axis. And you see these curves, they are all very similar, right? You will see that on the real axis, they will give completely different behavior. And the argument here is this. Let's analyze gap function on the real axis. And let's first of all do something simple. Let's analyze interaction on the real axis. That was interaction on the Matsubara axis. And I said, remember I said from the very beginning, I already chose an attractive channel. So this interaction is attractive. That's why I get superconductivity. Let's take this guy and trivially convert it to real axis. To convert this interaction, don't need much, just rotate. That's it. It's an analytical function, so then conversion is trivial. And then you find interesting stuff. I just looking at this equation. That first of all, of course, on the real axis, my interaction becomes complex. It's standard thing for any frequency dependent function. This function is real on the Matsubara axis, but complex on the real axis is how you get um, Cauchy theorem converting function with, on the Matsubara axis with the imaginary part of the function on the real axis. And of course, it all works here. But if we look at real part of the function, we find an interesting cosine pi gamma over 2. So this guy becomes repulsive for gamma larger than 1. You may say, well, not a big deal, because interaction is complex, so the sign of real part doesn't mean much. But let's look at the sign of imaginary part, and you find that there is sine pi gamma over 2. So this guy vanishes at gamma equal to 2. And so you get a very strange situation, that for this particular value of gamma, where we find some interesting behavior, with other solutions, 
you start with the, on Matsubara axis, you have interaction which is completely attractive. On the real axis, you have interaction which is completely repulsive. And it's really a unique situation here. It doesn't happen in a conventional situation because their attraction is on both axes. And then you can ask, aha, then how the gap, the gap, gap, how the gap function looks on the real axis. Because time is running and I went slower than I was supposed to, I'll just show you very quickly how it looks like. And then you will see that what special happens at gamma fluid. So it turns out, you take this n equal to zero solution itself because you expect that it should continuously involve, not in the Savara axis, but let's check whether it continuously involves at least in the real axis and just see how it works. And let's do it this way. This is, remember, we start with something which is completely regular, solution for some value of gamma between one and two. Convert it. You can convert it two ways. Either do Pade, which is now numerical, can be done very accurately at some frequency range, or what we actually did, we converted equation and solved equation on the real axis. So this is real solution. And you find out that this simple guy, this very nicely looking guy on the Matsubara axis, becomes crazy oscillating guy on the real axis. Both real and imaginary part of the gap function oscillate. And most important here, oscillation by itself is not a big deal. But mostly important is that if you take a phase of this complex function, and plot how phase evolves as a function of omega. You start seeing phase slips. Phase jumps by two pi several times. And you may ask, aha, what happens? These are number of phase slips. How many times the phase changes by two pi? And you see this number of phase slips keeps increasing as gamma approaches two. It becomes larger and larger. So it's more and more oscillating. And oscillating more and more like crazy. And then, last thing to say. If you have function which is completely regular on Matsubara axis and functions that has phase slips, number of phase slips by 2 pi on the real axis, then when you rotate, the phase slips might disappear somehow, right? And they can only disappear if they are vortices. And then vortices will ease the phase slips. So which means that if I take what I have right now here, this guy, and start rotating it towards this one. Then on the way there should be vortices. And this is what you can check by now converting the function onto complex plane and solving gap equation on the complex plane. And this is what we did. Again, solving equation on the complex plane. Here is what we found. That as you start increasing gamma, vortices, red dots are vortices, zero of complex function. They appear one by one on imaginary axis. They come, sorry, on, on, in the complex plane. They come from lower half plane into upper one. And you see their number increases. Their number increases, increases, increases. And finally, their number becomes infinite with gamma equal to two. So the number of vortices at gamma equal to two becomes infinite. And there, it's in some sense, it's similar to what's called abricots of, array of abricots of vortices in real space. I will not make full analogy, but we also have one dimensional set of vortices that follow some particular func formula as a function of frequency and extend to infinite frequency. It actually, at this point at infinity, the function has essential singularity. And there is a mathematical beauty of dealing with this function as essential singularity. So you look at the real, real frequency axis. And you see that, yes, a lot of unusual things happen right at um, gamma equal to 2. The one that I found that on, uh, when I calculated energy, I found that many other states uh, merge and you have gapless excitations. So gapless excitation on one axis means infinite number of vortices in a complex plane. And I probably have to stop here. Uh, let me quickly show you, I wanted to show you this, but let me show you quickly, uh, just one step. Yes. What happens when you go to larger gamma? Vortices start moving back. So you start from here, the essential almost symmetrically start going away. So we have a situation very similar to what I showed with energy. Something special happens at gamma equal to two. 
and then on both sides of this point, vortices are moving away. This is just, I'll let me, I already skipped, so let me tell you very quick. And I can ask, is there a qualitative difference between what I see for smaller and larger gum? And the answer is yes, there is. Let me say this and then finish. For gamma, let's look at density of states, physically measurable quantity. For gamma smaller than two, you get a gap and then continuum of excitations. You go to gamma larger than two, you get a gap and continuum of excitations. But in between is this crazy point where there's infinite number of vortices, where it's essential singularity, density of state has a crazy form. It has a bunch of data functions. So it looks like you have infinite number of bound states in the system instead of, so continuum transforms into a set of bound states. And you can say, aha, uh -huh. so this is gap continuum, this is gap continuum, this is a bunch of bound states. So what's the difference between this guy and this guy? It turns out that this guy has a non-integrable edge singularity. So you start forming bound, which means in reality, with, if you have a finite number of states in the system, you start forming a condensate. You start forming a one state whose degeneracy is proportional to the total number of particles in the system. It's like Bose-Einstein condensation here. And just to finish the last thing, what happens, basically all these bound states move into one state which acquires the degeneracy proportional to the total number of systems. And this is my argument that there is state one, there is state two, this state, as in fact, I didn't say this because of time, but there is also clear topological difference between this state and this state, if you look at where the poles are. And the last thing, which I will just write here, but not mention, if you have a critical point, we expect that there should be lines coming of this critical point. And the last thing, which I will not describe because of time, in fact, yes, there are lines, and I'll try to, yes, there are lines coming of this point. How they go is detail. It's just artistic writing here, nothing more. So there are lines coming of this point. What happens in between? It's very strong phase fluctuations, associated with the fact that we have gapless excitations at this point. So let me just flash conclusion, sorry. Oops, I need to, yes, I need to flash conclusions here. So main point which I tried to say is that you look at the problem, which experimentally shows up in many situations superconductivity at the verge of some other order appearing. And it turns out that you look theoretically at this problem and you find that it's very different from BCS. This is not a Cooper instability. This is a totally different phenomenon, appearance of this complex exponent in the gap equation. And one consequence of this non-BCS non is this infinite number of solutions for the pairing gap, which at one point, from discrete ones become form continuous set. And this is a special point. And we also see the special point by looking at um, what happens on a complex plane, and then we find that the number of vortices becomes infinite at this, um, uh, at this critical value of gamma. I didn't talk about different Riemann surfaces, so let me skip this. And uh, what we know for gamma equal to two is that correction to phase stiffness becomes, becomes divergent. So basically, phase stiffness remains uh, very small, uh, essentially zero. And the system then is, uh, U1 symmetry is unbroken down to zero temperature. Okay, some details really requires longer talks and longer discussions, but I hope that I gave at least some flavor of what all the story is. This is the last slide. I tell you about one part of the story. There are a number of other parts associated with the same complex behavior near a quantum critical point. And so this is an incomplete list of people with whom I worked on uh, various subjects here. Thanks very much. Given some microscopic model like a Hamiltonian or an action, uh -huh. uh, what kind of uh, truncation of diagrams would you need for this generalized Eliasberg equations to be valid? Like, is it R RPA or, or something? 
Ah, uh, you are asking a somewhat different question. How to start with the Hamiltonian and obtain effective interaction mediated by soft fluctuations? Right. This is a standard problem story of the type how to get diagrammatically stoner instability in the middle. The answer is you need to close your eyes. <laughs> yes. Okay. And select particular letter diagrams. I see. Yes. So every time this for any problem, it's done the same way. So, you so select the same, particular um, set of graphs that uh, eventually give you interaction mediated by something with vanishing mass. So, so it's the same set of diagrams that are there in the Yes, you can call this RPA. I prefer not to call this RPA because I don't understand what RPA is. <laughs> uh, but uh, particle letter. Right, right, it right, can right. be maximally crossed. I see. I but see. still, you no, know, maximally crossed is letter if you reverse in a yeah. different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's either maximally crossed or a combination of bubbles and this wine glass diagrams. Right. But one way or another. How to do it properly? Uh, only long range interaction. If you have long range interaction, you can justify what I just said mm -hmm. rigorously. Mm -hmm. Large n, you can extend the theory to large n again to justify this. At the end of the day, I said n equal to one, so I don't know whether it's uh, satisfactory for you or not. But the answer is yes, some sort of letter. Right, right. And then once you get it, the rest is parametrical, they have good parameters to make uh, fermions faster than bosons, even non fermi liquid fermions. Right. Faster than bosons. Right. Yeah. Luca has a question. Oh, great. Yeah, I just had a quick, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, so is there is there a physical system that has gamma equals two? Yes. Electrons okay. form an interaction in a situation when dress the by frequency vanishes. This is one of the most studied systems. You take electron phonon system with some bare Debye frequency, and it's known when the electron phonon coupling constant approaches roughly one half. Exact number depends on the model. It's always close to one half. Dress Debye frequency vanishes, and you have superconductivity at a temperature which numerically is very close to what comes out from the studies at gamma equal to two. Then you can ask a question, can anyone study it really, stiffness, et cetera, for these models? And my answer is nobody. So it has not been studied because people focused only on, on uh, the onset temperature for the pain, but didn't go deep into the pain regime. But the short answer is yes, this is electron phonon problem when electron phonon coupling constant is at critical value, which is always close to one half. And to be honest with you, if you are very, very close to a critical point, remember I told you that you need to have a situation when uh, phonons can be treated as slow compared to electrons. If you are very, very close to this transition, then this condition is not satisfied. And to be exactly on good theoretical ground, what you will need to do is to take a double limit when the renormalized Debye frequency goes to zero and Fermi energy goes to infinity. Then you are on a completely sharp theoretical ground. Or equivalently, take number of fermions, number of fermionic flavors equal to infinity. It will be the same. Mm -hmm. But the model itself, electron phonon interaction at coupling constant close to half. Because then the rest Debye frequency is omega d square root 1 minus 2 lambda. But is there a sense in which gamma larger and larger corresponds to more and more relevant kind of perturbation of the, the Fermi surface? Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And you may ask a different question. Is there, a, is there experimental realization of any model with gamma larger than two? For this, I will, can do blah, 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 but in reality, mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to, you need special arrangement for this. So all the story is more to show that there is non-BCS pairing, and in particular case, this pairing produces something com completely different from BCS. Mm -hmm. and the story do, do, the number do, do you think there's a, a maximum to gamma? Because an, an analogy, so in, in CFT, oper you know, you, operators can't be as relevant as you want? No, no, gamma can be any number you want. I okay. can hook up a model with any value of gamma. Let me assume mm -hmm. that by crazy reasons, omega square, omega four, omega six terms, they all cancel, all regular terms cancel out. I just 
RPA or I just hard refork such that they all cancel out. And I okay, start. Okay, but this would be a unitary. This would be a unitary. I, I mean, I understand that you can truncate diagrams and, and make things happen, but you think this would be a solution to, to a unitary microscopic model? Again, I can take a model mm -hmm. in which I can start with bare bosonic propagator with any power of frequency I want. Analytic, analytic function. And then on top of that model, I will add interaction with um, formats. And I guarantee you that I will get any gamma I want from this model. I'm not saying that it's physical. But... <laughs> You have mentioned uh, superconductivity to non from liquid transition by tuning a uh, parameter 1 over n. I'm kind of lost. Is that supposed the physical meaning of that? Is the number of flavors or fermion flavors? Or? No, it's not number of flavors. It's related to matrix large n, but if you're asking about physical meaning, it's much more simple than this. Uh, when I, what I said, and basically, I, when you want to write down interaction with some gapless boat, what you do, you do particular RPA series of that. Yeah. Then you get one interaction, in a part, the same in a particle-particle and a particle-whole chain. And then you have it's like n equal to 1. Add vertex correction to this interaction. We did this. Once you add vertex correction to this interaction, you immediately start separating between interaction in the particle-whole channel and interaction in the particle-particle channel. And then everything depends on how strong you are want to make this vertex corrections. It goes, of course, beyond what I said, that vertex corrections is small. But if you want to relax this constraint a little bit, yes, you can always find two different interactions. Then there's a question, can I use the same equations? Technically not, but, uh, but at least I can get two interactions which are different. So this I can do. Or just say, okay, I take a phenomenological model with two different interactions, one in a particle particle, one in a particle whole chain. Then n is a ratio of two interactions. We call this n by historical reasons, like it's just, just some parameter. So it has nothing to do with integer n, just a number. So for the critical value, the numerical value, how large is that? Uh, why do I do this way? I'm not sure. Yes, here, here is my light. I want to show you, I guess it was this one, right? Yes, this one. Yeah, here it is. Well, it depends what gamma you want to have. So, if you want to come closer to one, don't ask me what happens at larger gamma, but I can tell. Uh, basically, this line is like this. It goes like that, reaches one at gamma equal to one, and then continue along this line. So, if you are somewhere here, for gamma larger than one, you can go from superconducting state to non-fermi liquid state by very small adjustment. So what I told you, the story, was the story along this line. Exactly. If you want to go a little bit below this line, you get nice superconductivity. If you go above this line, you get nice non liquid. But if you want to stay here, yeah, there is a transition. And I would not pay that much attention to what number is. It's important that it's clear that in one limit, large n, you just can sum up Cooper logarithms. And summing up Cooper logarithm gives you nothing. So that means the system remains in the normal state. In the other limit, you get complex exponent. Once you get complex exponent, the system becomes superconducting. And at this point, you get essentially logarithmical corrections instead of complex exponent. So uh, just to go back to the half of Landau level question. Uh -huh. um, is there a way to estimate what the effective value of n would be there? Because just to see if that does fall into the normal state as expected. 
um, given that gamma one is third. going three three one third. Yeah, oh, it's here. To, yeah. to an effective like yeah, from but, from the yeah. I see. So uh, just just to just to see if uh, like what how yes. how quantitatively yeah, this but I probably agree to very quickly. The problem is the same, but for half field lambda level, there is one extra point. I said you find attractive channel. Hmm. There is a statement that the corresponding channel is repulsive. Right. In their case. So you right. get everything the same, but you will not get superconductivity. Yeah. You get non Fermi liquid, yeah. which will stay there by different reasons. Right. Because of no attraction. I see, I see, I see, I see. Right, right, right. right. Any more questions? So let's thank Andre again. Okay, thank you. It's a sign difference between yeah, two yeah, patches. Yeah, exactly. So, so this OC. Yeah, yeah. It's just automatically repulsive. So there's no. no uh, but, but you could have, if you have a spin for from the surface, how much you want to get the OC? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. That's a spin single and a triple it's a difference between uh,